Navidia Chalo. I'm moderating this uh, session, and my co moderator is Dr. Alfred Muteta. Um, the session is a social accountable health professions, education, governments, NGOs, and international agencies. I'd like to request the first presenter to introduce himself and then uh, begin the presentation. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'll, I'll try to get a quick start of this. My name is Björk Paulsdottir. I um, lead a network of socially accountable health workforce education institutions uh, called the Training for Health Equity Network, or the NET. Uh, I am really privileged and excited to be here. Uh, this is uh, a group that I've been following since we did the midterm evaluation of, of MEPI and NEPI, and it's exciting to see where it's at. So let's just get started. Uh, so if you could go to the next slide. If somebody can press the button for the next slide because I don't have access to you or do you want me to share my screen? Yeah, okay, perfect. Okay, so the Training for Health Equity Network. Oh, just the previous one, please. The previous slide. Okay, so as we've heard in, in the uh, keynote speakers before, social accountability uh, is a challenging task, uh, addressing it and, and figuring out what exactly it is both Dr. Martin, Dr. Moineau, and Dr. Binyawaho pointed out how important it is, but also how complex it is. And I, I think it's, it's interesting to note that often academic environments aren't the easiest environment to, to implement social accountability because of the way we currently measure success, which is often about grants and publications rather than social impact. And we are, have a more of a focus on competitions rather than collaboration. However, uh, there are some great things happening in, in uh, social accountability. And I just wanted to share a few. It was hard to pick what to talk about because a lot has happened. But if you can go to the slide, uh, the next slide. So as you see here, it's a community. So the NET is a community of practice for socially accountable health workforce education. Uh, we do research, advocacy, mutual capacity development. Now, I don't know what happened to the PowerPoint. Is it better if, if you get me to share the screen? Because I don't know. I can't see the PowerPoint at the moment. Sure, I can't also see it. I don't know what happened. Uh, Secretariat, can you help us? Hello. Is 
should I? I, I think uh, maybe you better um, continue if you have your, <laughs> okay, so I don't I know that you can even share. I, I will, yeah, I hope uh, I'll, I'll keep track of, yeah, so, so just start sharing as soon as possible and I'll follow up. So All right. uh, the, the, at some point there should be a map of the founders and members and partners of the training for health equity and they are based on on four continents including four of them are in africa in, in south africa in sudan and in malawi so uh yeah this is a little hard to maybe i need to look at my powerpoint so uh one of the things that that the slide that should be up there now if okay there's some screen sharing so let me just wait for that because it's a little hard to because I'm not reading the exact text of the, the slide. Okay, so perfect, perfect slide. So the key elements of because social accountability is is a very has a very broad definition. I, I think it's important to talk about what the Net School uh, look at at social accountability strat strategies. And the main among them is focusing on addressing the needs of the communities that they serve or the region that they serve. And it's about creating these, these problem solving skills uh, that, that Dr. Vinyawara also talked about. Another key element is community and stakeholder engagement. And there was a bit of a discussion before of what is community and what is stakeholder. And, and I agree with uh, Geneviève that this is something that, that institutions need to define for themselves. And it's important to think about what engagement means. And in our definition, it's about true engagement. They are full partners in, in, in all aspects of, of education, research, and service. Another key strategy, even though it's targeted student selection, some of them have a specific quota for rural and remote or underserved populations. Other have specific uh, sort of psychosocial criteria, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the focus is on getting the students that you think will are most likely to meet the needs in underserved communities. And another key element is learning in the context and underserved settings uh, where we hope the graduates will, will stay. And a final one, there, there's more, but I'm just speeding through this. It's actually engaging community-based practitioners and community members as faculty and mentors. So you can go to the next slide. Another slide I'm gonna just fly over. Uh, the first project of the NET was actually developing an institutional evaluation framework based on what these schools had in common and what we wanted to look at. So it was just asking some core questions. What are the needs our institution is addressing? How do we work? It's about partnership. Who do we engage with? What kind of voice do they have? Uh, when we talk about communities, are they tokens or, or are they really involved in our work? What do we do? The who, what, when, and where? And what difference do we make? And obviously our research is building on this framework and the theory of change that we've developed. And most of it is focusing on, on the difference that we make. So if we go to the next slide, uh, so the kind of research we've been doing uh, is graduate outcome studies. It's more than graduate tracking. It's looking a little beyond beyond that where it's a, uh, and I'll go into that a little bit later, impact of social accountability strategies. And I think one of the benefits is that we've got schools from both high and low income countries, middle income countries, very different contexts, very different health systems. And we've tried to find common denominators so that, that we can look at what works across contexts. And we're looking at, obviously, the, the perhaps the lowest hanging fruit in research is how do these strategies impact um, workforce recruitment to underserved region and retention there. And then looking at impact on communities and the broader social return on investment in, in in social accountability strategies in education. Next slide. You could go to the next slide. Yes, no. If you can click on the next slide, okay, I will start my ramble. I hope I'm not speaking too fast. So 
uh, the graduate study aims, I'm not going to read it, is to really understand whether and how student admission strategies, as well as what happens in the black box of, of the education experience, influences where graduates practice and their career choices. Okay, I guess the PowerPoint is gone again because uh, it has some, some more details on it. Uh, Okay, uh, <laughs> bit of a challenge, like social accountability. Um, so the next slide is about uh, the methods that we used. So these were multiple, multiple methods, uh, including surveys that were built on um, actually an Australian database that was tracking health workers, but designed to focus on equity, and what we did with the difference group, because the, the contact is so different, is that each country that participated, and we now have around uh, 6,000, we're following 6,000 uh, students and graduates across a 10-year span, looking at both entry, you know, what their career goals or practice intentions are at the beginning of their studies, what uh, it is at the exit and then year one, year four, year seven, and year 10. So we now have, I think it's about 6,000 uh, in um, uh, nine schools in six countries. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. So hard without the, in, right? so, so one of the things that we are looking at that's important is we're looking at the background, ethnicity, socioeconomic background uh, and, and using descriptive statistics uh, and, and really correlating, obviously, uh, both the, the, the entry and exit exam. So the findings, if the, the presentation comes up again, it is slide number nine. So students, whether they are coming, whether the, it's the institutions in high, lower, middle income countries, they are much more likely to come from lower income quintiles, and they're more likely to come from rural backgrounds, which is probably not surprising since, since there is this focus on addressing needs in underserved communities and because they have targeted strategies. But the interesting part is that they don't all share the same strategy. The, another finding is there's significant associations between rural origin and intention to work with rural and remote population upon entry and exit. So actually over time in these schools, if anything, there's a twofold increase between entry and exit for intention to practice in, in rural and or general uh, rural or remote areas and in generalist specialists such as it's called different things in different country, family medicine, primary care, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And another finding is that those from rural and underserved backgrounds are much likely to plan to work abroad. So the next, okay, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see. So methods, if you, so are you, uh, Hello. Are you there? Yes. Oh. I don't I don't know what is happening. I think we are losing a lot of time. But, okay. The host muted me. Oh. Okay, can you? Oh now I'm okay. Okay, uh, can I share my screen? No, I, I still can't share my. So if somebody then who has the PowerPoint can actually 
skip ahead a few slides. Yes, or let me share. That would, oh, no, I still can't share. So further slides, oh, oh. Okay, so can I share my, okay, now I have to, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, I have to find the, um, Oh, that's yeah. Okay, that's better. now yeah. Well, now I have to. Sorry, my now I have to find my slide. Oh, it just crashed. Okay. Okay. Apologies for that. So here we are. Okay, we'll speed through this. Okay, so uh, so what the findings here? I'm gonna just like to take a look at it. They are more like, I, as I mentioned, they're more likely to come from low-income quintiles, rural backgrounds, etc. And here's a quick introduction to another series of research that we did with our two uh, Filipino schools. Uh, oops. Okay, now I can't get my notes, so I will have to improvise. Okay, so we did a literature review. There was a retrospective study on where graduates were uh, and a case study both looking at uh, perceived impact uh, by engaging with stakeholders, including faculty, student, health service provider, government, et cetera, et cetera. Again, I know the time is short. So here, just quick outline of results. What is clear uh, that many more graduates from the, yes, yeah, so, sorry, I didn't explain the fact that this was actually the comparative study. What they did is they had uh, two socially accountable schools and then compared uh, the outcomes with schools uh, with uh, graduates serving co from conventional schools. So they had graduates from socially accountable schools and, the, the and, and uh, defined a type of underserved community and used the same criteria, but looked at communities served by schools, uh, by graduates that were not, that were trained sort of in a conventional way. So comparatively, 61% uh, of graduates were practicing in small communities. Uh, rural and poorer communities versus 12 from conventional schools. Uh, again, I don't know if you want to, I don't want to read this, especially since we've lost quite a bit of time. But one of the interesting part, well, what they did is they uh, identified uh, proxy indicators for community impact. So they looked at, took uh, uh, sort of the health, and, and they looked at mothers, uh, new mothers uh, in those communities. And what they found uh, is that there was a statistically significant difference in the communities that uh, were served by socially accountable graduates, if you will. Uh, they, had, they were more likely to show up with all their vaccinations. Uh, they were more likely to be uh, receiving care uh, delivering in in uh, with the health practitioner present, they were more likely uh, to uh, receive, you know, vaccinations, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, again, I don't want to read this, but I don't know if you have time to to look at it. Uh, and and you could see also that the mothers were much more aware of what they needed to bring. They were more likely to breastfeed, et cetera, et cetera. And this again. I will, I hope uh, this is possible, but I can share a list of publications so you can actually look at this. This actually uh, resulted in about, I think, six publications. The general overview of, of the one of the methods that was used, which was a case study format, and the impact on learner was really about understanding social determinants of health, becoming problem solvers, and learning to how to work with, with other partners and communities. Uh, and then increased access they had showed in the retrospective study that there were now areas that had no health professionals or, or certainly no medical doctors now had 
uh, graduates from these two schools working there. Uh, so both the quality and quantity in general seem to prove. And also because all both the students and faculty are very much involved in data collection. So this actually brought much more information about these underserved communities. And, and that data is something that they provided access to uh, for um, provided access to for for people that uh, uh, for the health services, utilities, et cetera, et cetera. So quickly, uh, so what we're currently working on, we're working on building up what's done in, in, in the Philippines is a social return on investment studies. It's pretty close to finish, but obviously COVID made a big impact, but it's quite interesting because it's looking much broader about return on investment. What is the value of actually having graduates remain in under, go to and remain in underserved communities uh, the work that the students do while they're there is also they are involved in addressing many of the uh, social determinants of health. So they are helping with waste management, uh, different kind of nutrition, et cetera, yeah. all depending on and working with community stakeholders to identify priorities. We're also involved in a study on uh, looking at how the social determinants of health are incorporated into um, education and practice low and middle income countries and uh, the sharing of, of, of what we're doing is we, we realize is that we need, uh, that there's a lot of great research and work that's been out there, that's done out there, but we've recently participated uh, in some work with, um, with uh, the Network Towards Unity for Health where they've been using a tool that was sort of uh, an assessment tool that was a combination of, of what was done by Aspire and also Beyond Flexner that was led by Dr. Fitzhugh Mullen uh, and then the NET tool really looking at what are the basics for those who are just starting out in social accountability. And one thing, even though there's amazing things that are taking place across the world, uh, what we're not doing enough of is really looking and measuring impact. And I think one thing that we've been able to show with the NETS work is even though it's hard to measure and there's not gonna be a linear correlation, we need to really be trying to measure the stuff that's hard to measure and that we can actually build the case for and evidence for uh, what to me seems perfectly uh, sensical. Social accountability is really about addressing needs and shifting the way we measure success. So I, uh, we have a resource center online on our website, and I'll be happy uh, to find a way to share the list of publications. And we want to hear from you and the work you're doing, because I think the more we work together, share tools, share evidence, and I think this came out before, the stronger uh, we can advocate for this. And, and, and actually, WHO has now agreed that uh, one of their indicators in the National Health Workforce account is accreditation should be focused, include social accountability standards. And I think it's up to us both to define what that means and work together to advocate for that. So thank you and apologies for, for, for the little intro. Uh, thank you very much, Joe, for, for, and we also appreciate, um, Apologize for the hiccups we, we had. Um, now the, the presenters have been given their hosts, co-hosts, so they can make their own and they can present. Uh, before the next week presenter, I, I would like to say that if, um, uh, to ask the audience to put their questions in the Q and A, um, which is below your screens. And if you are chatting with for anything else, then you you put in the chat. But for questions, there is a, a a provision for that, which we shall go through after after the five presentations. And we have lost a lot of time. So the next presenters should uh, I beg your pardon, but I will have to be <laughs> to be strict with time. Uh, so let's have Elizabeth N talking about building infrastructure for sexual harassment prevention and response at the University of Lagos. 
Yes, thank you. Um, I can share our slides for us. So I'm going to present with Ada from University of Lake House. Okay. So you um, can share, okay. Yeah. Uh, are you able to see the slides? Yes, we can. Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, so my name is Elizabeth Christian, and I'm from Northwestern University, and I'm presenting with Adam from University of Lagos. Wonderful. And we're presenting on building capacity to promote a sexual misconduct and harassment free work zone. Um, this was a supplement that we had to our D43 through Fogarty from NIH. So just a quick quick outline. We'll just go through the background and the needs, our project aims, the different people that were involved on our team and how um, that came together, our activities, and then our challenges and lessons learned. All right. So in University of Lagos, we noticed that there was a need for Unilab to strengthen its sexual harassment policies. And because of this need, um, we saw that through this maybe we said that there was an evidence from the Nigerian demography that one in every three women in Nigeria expect, experiences sexual violence in their lifetime. And reports have also shown that there is a high prevalence of sexual harassment and rape in Nigerian universities. Then the basis of all this is that there's a 1999 constitution that says that the fundamental objectives and directive um, principles of policy obligates the government to ensure that the education, that the education that the university is a, that is, is a safe environment and safe and secure for students and, and staff. Then in, in 2020, mm -hmm. July 2020 to be specific, the Nigerian government passed a bill that is called the Sexual um, Anti-Sexual Harassment Bill. Next slide. In University of Lagos, we have three existing policies. For the sake of this grant, we'll be focusing on the 2019 gender policy. And um, initially, everything is more, whenever we hear um, um, gender policy, we, we, it's mostly like directed to the females. So now what we are doing is we are trying to make an office, an equity where we include both the males and females, not just the male, females. Next slide. Okay, so just a brief overview of our project aims from the supplement. Aim one, in partnership with Northwestern offices, we will establish an office of equity at Unilag and develop tools to enhance the effectiveness of policies. Aim two, work with Unilag leadership to enhance and support awareness. And aim three, publicize commitment from leadership for sustained engagement from peer institutions. So just a brief overview of our team members. We have women from all different types of backgrounds and specializations. Some of our team members are communication specialists, law specialists, medical professionals, healthcare. And then we also have global health and global programming specialists. So we all came together to work together on this project. Uh, from Northwestern University, the different offices that we got involved were the Institute for Global Health, but then we also reached out to our Northwestern Women's Center, which has been around for 35 years and has experience advocating for both the creation of other peer, in, peer centers, such as the Counseling Office of Equity, and also advocating for the uh, awareness of the policies and for policy changes. Yeah, and then in University of Lagos, we have the Equity of Women and Women's Center, which um, through this grant, um, we are, through this project, we are going to change it to Office of Equity. So as, like I said initially, to include both the male and the female, we have a task force already that is existing on the sexual harassment. We have the counseling units, um, the Dean of Students, the medical center and, and the grievance redress community. So all this community, all, all these offices are working together to um on this project. Next slide. Then initially one when we submitted our proposal, this were the this was our initial plan. We're going to create um an, an implementation office, do some learning sections, have high level meetings and do some trainings. 
Next slide, but due to the pandemic, well, as a result of the pandemic, all our plans, most of the, the plan, initial plan was that people, um, some of our team members from Unilag, we are going to travel to Northwest and for about a week to understudy the different offices at Northwestern so that we, to give us um, a basis to come back and develop our, our infrastructure. But due to the pandemic, what we had to do was turn, change the um, learning section, the, the travel into a learning section. So we had about eight virtual learning sections that we had to do, which was, a little bit, which was intense and it's achieved the purpose. Next slide. Now, in reality, um, the project was supposed to start kick off in October, um, but um, because of, um, sorry, the project was supposed to kick off in September, but there, we had some delays trying to get um, funds and trying to restructure because of the pandemic. So like I said, initially the um, learning section was supposed to be from November to January, but because of um, pandemic in our run from November to December. That so our in, our reality is what we see in yellow right now. Um, next slide. Then we have we have some virtual learning sections. Um, we have interesting topics. Each of the offices had to do an introduction and learn from each other. Which is our first section. Then we learned the federal laws and university policies how to manage incidences, procedures and workflows, support for survivors, um, training modules, which we are work currently working on, um, gain buying. So we learn from the different com um, institutions. Um, next slide. Right. So yeah, so from, oh, sorry. <laughs> So from our uh, our different virtual sessions, we had some challenges and some lessons we learned. So um, our challenges is that it would have been ideal to have a lengthy period of the working meetings rather than doing the bi-monthly so that we could set aside more time and tackle it. Um, but the scheduling was something that we had to work with. We also had the challenges of internet connectivity and just competing schedulings from everyone turning to Zoom and competing with the different grant Zooms, project Zooms, and that type of thing. Uh, we learned how uh, we could have restructured our pre and post tests um, because we initially made them up as if it was for someone attending and we should have made them up more for our direct working group. Um, but some lessons learned is that um, it did work to share our policies and practices between our institutions just for the, just for the ability to learn between each other and um, show what can be applied in different settings. And uh, we were able to engage more faculty both from Unilag that they were able to join us because they didn't have to travel and from Northwestern because they could join us from different offices to the Zoom sessions and just come to the link. So um, both some challenges and lessons learned. Anything to add, Ada? No, I think that was just good. Okay, great. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, thank you. We want to thank the Fogarty International Center for helping fund the project and give us the supplement and then University of Lagos for their chancellor and leadership for being supportive and our Northwestern University offices and administrative for also supporting the project itself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth and the company. Um, the questions are, are there in the two and answer questions, but we, uh, we shall look at them at the end. We still have more presenters. Uh, maybe to just, uh, maybe I didn't inform you that when I put on my video, it, I, uh, maybe two minutes remaining to your time, then you, you, you know that time is up. And uh, so we have the next one, Bloss talking about healthcare professionals' perceptions of community-based rehabilitation in KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. Uh, 
Hello. Is she there? Oh, he? Okay. Can we have the next one? Terin Yang? Uh, yes, I, I'm here. I will start sharing my presentation. Okay. Um, just to inform you that maybe two minutes to the end, I will put on my video to, okay. to warn you. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Can I just check? Can you see my presentation? Yes, we can see it. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, so thank, thank you for the opportunity to join you today to, to share with you this very exciting project. Uh, I'm Taryn Young and I'm based at Stellenbosch University, where I head the Department of Global Health. And this is a collaborative uh, project involving many uh, collaborators from across the world. And it's focusing on improving the reporting of health equity within observational studies. Um, so it, it's the strobe equity guideline that we are busy developing. So just moving on to the next slide. Um, if we uh, consider uh, health research, uh, a lot of research is being conducted through observational studies. So this is where we talk about surveys or codes or case control studies, for example. And, and these uh, observational research plays a key role in shedding light on health inequities. Now, if we talk about inequities, we're referring to avoidable or un and unfair disparities between individuals and populations. And it's unfair because uh, these uh, can be resolved through the reasonable action. If you look at the, the picture with the, the cyclist, um, the top one is, is where, what would one would refer to as equality, where you will give everyone the same size bicycle regardless of age or size or whether they're in a wheelchair or not. And the bottom illustration is an example of equity. Now, inequity is driven by many factors which can be summarized in an acronym called PROGRESS PLUS. And I'm, I'm not going to read through all of those, but you can see what um, makes up um, the various aspects linked to PROGRESS PLUS. Um, now, coming to the STROBE guideline, the STROBE guideline is a reporting guideline for observational studies that has been around since 2007. And the key aim of this reporting guideline is to improve the accuracy and completeness of reporting an observational study. And more and more authors are using this and journals are requiring authors to actually show that they've adhered to these reporting guidelines when they submit papers uh, for publication. Now, why this project? Um, when we, we consider observational studies, equity indicators are often collected. But if we look at the strobe guideline and this, the picture that you see here is actually the, what's called the strobe checklist. If you go through this checklist, you see that it doesn't specifically address health inequities. So the goal with our project is to develop an equity extension for this uh, reporting guideline for observational studies. In terms of our methods, we're using a five-phased plan, starting with assessing the reporting of health equity in observational studies, then seeking international feedback to improve the reporting of health um, equity, establishing consensus uh, through engagement with knowledge users, as well as the researchers, as the producers of research, we're planning to evaluate the relevance of the reporting guideline for indigenous research. And then uh, step five is to do wide dissemination and seeking endorsement of the various knowledge users. And throughout all of this, we are implementing an integrated knowledge translation approach, which is also illustrated in this diagram, where through this approach, we are want to find common ground to prepare researchers, prepare knowledge users, the public, and also the research agenda 
to be able to, to take up this guideline that will emerge from this project. So what have we done so far? We, we are really at the beginning phase of this project. In the first six months of the four year project, we've put together our team and we are a big team with various collaborators for, um, with showing uh, also with a lot of diversity in it. Um, we, have a, we have a technical oversight committee established as well as steering committees um, and role clarification done. And there's a process that we needed to follow to actually register this project with the Equator Network, which is the broad overarching network enhancing the quality and the transparency of health research. And then we, we have been busy with a lot of uh, protocol development. Um, but some of the exciting work that we have done also in the six months is actually to develop a rapid interim guidance for COVID-19 studies. As we all know, there's been an explosion of studies of covering various research questions and various designs. And, and one of the aspects we did was to look at each of the progress plus factors and to, to put forward the rationale and the relevance for COVID exposure, susceptibility, and also the capacity to respond. So some example, I'm not going to go through all of this, an example for maybe socioeconomic status, where the, the, there's differences in access and the up, uptake of health opportunities um, aligned to socioeconomic status as, as one example. Another one is linked to occupation where essential health workers and essential non-health workers are at a higher risk of disease. Um, and, and there's a few other examples that, that we've looked at. The, the paper summarizing all of this is currently in peer review. Now, um, drawing on this process and taking it further, we then came up with interim guidance for COVID-19 studies. Um, and, and to be able to come up with this, we started by looking at the consort reporting guideline. Now, consort is a brother or sister of strobe in that consort is for the reporting of trials. Um, and there is actually a consort equity uh, extension that exists. So we looked at this equity extension of consort to see which elements uh, or items may be applicable and relevant for the strobe reporting. We then discussed that with a, a panel made up of various stakeholders. We looked at an example of observational studies on COVID related research and applied that. And it's through that process that we came up with these 14 areas um, that the strobe checklist can be uh, considered to be enhanced further. And this is now forming the baseline for us as we will be moving forward. So in summary, in, the way, uh, in terms of our way forward, we believe that this work will be playing a key role uh, with a wide range of observational studies to improve the reporting of health equity. Uh, we, uh, we feel that our uh, diverse um, collaborative group will ensure that we get uh, uh, inputs from a wide audience and we look forward to deliver a reporting guideline to improve the reporting of equity within observational studies. So thank you very much. And my acknowledgement goes to the, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research that is uh, supporting and funding this project. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Young, for this uh, very nice presentation. I saw in the chat that uh, you really had a very good illustration of equity and equality. And thank you for keeping time. Um, can we have the next? I'm seeing only one question in the Q and the A port. Uh, uh, the next one is Dino Halib. Are you around? Yes, yes, yes. I can see you. Yes. 
time around. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Yeah, so uh, I would also so, put on my video when you have only two minutes left, you can start. Policy and process for so developing much. the next year. So I hope that you can see my screen. Yeah, yes, we can. Thank you, everybody. And I think everywhere in the world, good time for you all. I am Dr. Juno Muhammad Qalib from uh, Hargeisa University, the Clinical Teaching Coordinator. Today, I'm going to go through with you the policy and the processes for developing the National Harmonized Curriculum for medical schools in Somaliland. So as you all know, uh, Somaliland is a small country in Horn of Africa, is self-declared post-conflict country. Civil wars has destroyed our governmental structures, not only health structures, displace, not displacing only health workers, but displacing everybody, and also, nevertheless, loss of many valuable lives. And Somaliland now, in, 30, in celebration of their 30-year independence, uh, we have successful government and five elections so far. Unfortunately, we have some of the world's uh, worst health indicators, like maternal mortalities and so on. And due to the shortages of or lack of quality trained health education and health workers. The project that we go through uh, helped us in this in developing the curriculum is called Prepare for Practice, and it addresses the health workforce crisis through reforming higher education. The goal of this project was to produce graduate medical health cadres like doctors, nurses, and midwives, which are immediately prepared for clinical practice and also help in improving health outcomes for Somaliland people. Prepare for Practice is not only one um, entity or two entities, but it is a partnership and family ship for a long time. And Prepare for Practice is started in 2007 and unfortunately ending in 2021. As you can all see from the logos, my university, Edna Arden University, Amud University, our online partnership Medicine Africa is there, King's College is there, and our NGO set is also there. This uh, project was a part um, funded by UKAID Strategic Partnership for Higher Education and Innovation and Reform, which is shorted for SPHERE. Prepared for Practice not only focuses on curriculum, but it has three major pillars that focuses in different um, in different sectors of this project, which is undergraduate and learning and assessment, faculty international and institutional development, and policy and regulation. And policy and regulation is the section that we have been able to have support in developing the national curriculum for medical students. Reforming national education policy came from an intervention that development of implementation of the health education policy seemed at that time a very important place to start with. And since afterwards, the impact of that, Somaliland has the first national medical education policy has been produced. National task force was established in, and implemented. Somaliland first national assessment for medical schools has been conducted and also from that assessment, the production of national and um, medical education curriculum has been initiated. Talking about the curriculum, the curriculum has developed, as you can see from the six step method, identifying uh, and based on Somaliland population and community needs. It's all collaborative approach between the Somaliland government, the national regulators, university faculties, and also supported by our partners, Kings and Thet. It's all inclusive to all Somaliland medical institutions that give all 
that teaches undergraduate medical medical studies and also it was uh, co-developed with volunteers from like um, Manchester University and also from Somaliland clinicians interns and medical students the core of this um, curriculum was identified from the clinical situations as I mentioned and it focuses on our community needs but validated by looking into reports and surveys and statistics also from international organizations like WHO and UNICEF also logbook records from the students and interns as you can see the curriculum is a six-year um, curriculum which has a spiral model and divided into two sequential phases and has four major themes in module base so all those four themes are interrelated and integrated in between each other and they come through within all the six years of medical education the design of the medical curriculum was designed in accordance with the world federation for medical education it captures somaliland health needs and responds to the context that somaliland doctors practice and it highlights relevance to our community and the curriculum also highly and engages with proactive learning methods and also it adapts the CANMED framework for producing a prepared medical um, practitioner by the end of the six years of medical education in implementing the curriculum successfully our Somaliland government which is both the health and development ministry and the minister of higher education has signed off the curriculum and the leading schools in Somaliland already implemented the first year faculties are trying so hard to strengthen the curriculum committees developing academic committees with their institutions also developing faculty promotion and educational development centers to ensure the teachers or the lecturers that give the modules will be ready and will be equipped with the needed uh, equipment that they could teach but also we're having some challenges in shortage of lectures basically for biomedical and behavioral science some clinical supervisions and access to patients sometimes is very hard and also financing with this curriculum, we made sure that evaluation to the population need and continuous revision and renewal will be after each implementation of the curriculum has been done. So what we have been learned, the importance of the local ownership, we all of those collaborations between multi and multiple faculties, multiple universities, different partnerships coming together, taught us the ownership of what we have developed and cooperation of multi-sectoral leaders was very essential adaptation of crucial working effective in complex in long-term multi-stakeholder project like pfb also was one of the things that opened eyed to us the long-term funding and sustainability strategies there were the things that focus from day one of developing this curriculum to enable us to bring a deep change in our medical education infrastructure and leading to much more international or global wise leading universities as well so we can participate globally not only locally as well and i think by this i have to mention our partners everywhere that they were the key of our success and we this partnership didn't develop only partnership but is also a familyhood that we all have developed and that concludes my presentation thank you very much for making me participate thank you so much now as i was standing on my video it uh, you know you you said that, that was the end of your, your presentation thank you for the great work in somali Somalia. Um, Somaliland, sorry. Somaliland. Somaliland. Yes. Okay, Somaliland. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why. Yeah. I, I don't know yes, why. Somaliland. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. I know. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well done. So um the our fifth presenter did not sign in. Um I just want to check one more time if he is he or she is around, blows. If she if you are not there, then we open up. We have some maybe five means for questions. There was one question in the chew and answer uh, photo, uh, which which I took, you know, it was from Kawoya. And I think it was uh, directed to our first presenter, Joe. So it, it Kawoya want, was interested in how the social return on investment studies will be done. And what are the major variables you will be considering? I try to put some of it in writing because I knew I had taken up way too much time. But but <laughs> and, so, so so I don't know if, if people can see the answer. It would talk a little bit about the methodology, which is is uh, specifically focused on uh, engaging with stakeholders and having them prior identify and prioritize what they see as benefits and then uh, sort of assessing value of that and then obviously calculating what is called dead weight is what is would have happened any case. So um, there's a range, again, I didn't want to take up too much, but there's a range of outcomes because it depends on who you speak with. But the preliminary uh, findings from this study, which was in the Philippines, was everything from because the, the students uh, spend this much time in the community, they do everything from first a, a house assessment, then they offer, uh, depending on what the community decides is a priority, it could be everything from taking blood pressure, uh, organizing more exercising, uh, nutritional gardens, it, it has been different depending on, on the community. And then over time, so, so the students actually go in, assess the needs, work with the community to prioritize what needs to happen. And then the third year, they actually implement it. So there's a range of, of impact that, that they've seen, a lot of them related to the social determinants of health. So it depends on, in this case, that's how they work. Uh, they've also sort of looked at, at the fact that now people have uh, access to health workers that they didn't before, etc. So, so there's a lot of, lot of things. But what is interesting is that it actually is not the school that defines it, but the stakeholders and, in particular, communities them, them, themselves, what they see as most important. So sometimes it could be as, it could be transportation uh, to clinics, etc. So, so there's a range of activities, but it's a methodology. Uh, that can be used, and then there's a database of assigning values to, to, to those interventions. So the value isn't so much about the actual dollar amount, but the proportion of the money you cost out what the interventions would cost, and then the broader return on that investment as defined by stakeholders. Thank you so much, Bjorn. Oh. If I, if I don't pronounce the name properly, just forgive me. Very good um, pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, thank you for those very um, enlightening um, discussion discussions. Now we have another question by Elsie to, to Young. Could this approach be used beyond observational studies? Uh, so thanks for that question. Um, in terms of reporting guidelines in general, I will encourage everyone to have a look at the Equator Network, um, which is a, a website that gives access to all the reporting guidelines. And I think in summary, there's probably close to 100 different versions of reporting guidelines. And specifically linked to equity, the two existing equity extensions is the one linked to consort for trials. And then there's also one linked to PRISMA 
which is for uh, uh, systematic reviews. So yes, um, this uh, approach of, of a uh, promoting uh, transparent reporting and complete reporting span across various forms of research, and there's a lot of tools available to uh, facilitate that. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Yang. And uh, I would like to thank all the presenters. I don't know whether we still have uh, time, a, a little more time, or oh, because we lost a lot of time. Actually, our first presenter was very, very, um, what can I say? She was disadvantaged because we had issues of the internet and then presenting, I mean, sharing. So, John, it wasn't your fault, really. Uh, it was some um, technical hiccups here and there. Um, if there are no questions, more questions, because I don't see any, I would like to thank everybody who turned up. We had a very big turn up of maximum of 44, although now we are only 42. So the session was well attended. Thank you so much. On